Chapter 3 Hart radioed for an ambulance from Frederick to move the coffin. Despite Crawford's request, it came with lights flashing. So much for keeping a low profile. He had the idea that Fellows was still close by. If they didn't raise too big a ruckus, he hoped they might be able to catch him by surprise. No chance of a surprise now, Crawford thought. He'd take off. They loaded up the coffin. The two black and whites made a little caravan behind the ambulance. It was raining hard again. The windshield wipers on the patrol car were going double time. Green hadn't said a word since they'd left the cemetery. Something the matter? Crawford asked. No. Green shook his head. Just thinking. About fellows? Yeah. Why he's doing this? What's his motive? Something like that. Crawford shook his head. Don't waste your time. He clipped the cell phone back on his belt, reached into the pocket of his suit jacket, and found his handkerchief. He wiped his brow. The handkerchief came away smudged with dirt. Roll of paper towels under the seat if you want, Green said. Thanks. Crawford reached down. He found the roll and an oversized paperback book. Nine and a half mystics. He glanced over at Green. A little light reading? Ha! Huh. The deputy shook his head. No, it's for this course I'm taking. Night school. Really? Crawford smiled to himself. It took all kinds to make a police force. Spetsikowski was a jazz musician, a bass player, played twice a week, schedule permitting, at Art Donovan's on Park Street. Mandel was a chess freak. Politi had been a chef. Thinking about getting my master's, maybe, Green offered. Religious studies. That's what this is, huh? Crawford held up the book. Religion? Yeah, it's not as boring as it looks. I'm sure, Crawford frowned. He couldn't think of the last grown-up book he'd read. These days it was Green Eggs and Ham, or the visitor's brochure for Disneyland. So, fellows, Green said, if you knew what was on his mind, what he was after, wouldn't that put you a step ahead of him? Of course. But we've been chasing this guy for three years. We've spent Jesus, I don't know, thousands of hours trying to get into his head, Crawford sighed. There's no rhyme or reason to what he's doing. His actions are driven by urges that I don't think even he understands. I don't see how we're going to. So my deal is, let everyone else try and second-guess his motive. All I'm thinking about is how to catch him. Green still looked troubled. But if you have any ideas... The deputy didn't answer for a moment. No, he said finally. No, I don't. He did, though. Crawford could tell. He let it go for the moment. They had other things to do. The ambulance in front of them turned left, into the driveway of a big white building and circled around the back. Green parked the patrol car on the street. There'll be a few minutes unloading. We can go inside and get cleaned up, he said. The white building was the Burkittsville Town Hall. The sheriff, Ronald Cravens, according to the name etched on the glass plate door, had his office on the ground floor. The bathroom was right next door to it. Crawford used a hand towel to wash off his face, his arms, the back of his neck. He took off his shirt and wrung it out, then washed his chest. There was a knock on the door. Green reached in and handed him a gray t-shirt that said, Property of Pal. Crawford put it on. The shirt was at least two sizes too big. Property of the vacationing Sheriff Cravens, said Green through the door. He won't mind? Green shook his head. He must have bought a dozen of them last year for a charity drive. He won't even miss it. Crawford slipped on the shirt and dried his hands. He heard the phone ring in the sheriff's office and Green pick it up. He walked out into the hall and heard Green talking. No, no, I just can't. Not tonight. No, I can't talk now. I have to go, Kristen. I'm sorry. Hell yes, I mean it. No, all right, goodbye. The deputy walked out, shaking his head. God damn. He said it with feeling. Crawford offered a sympathetic smile. Thought you were getting divorced. Yeah, well, Green sighed. It's not as simple as all that. It never is. Green led Crawford downstairs into the basement. They turned right at the bottom of the stairs and followed the corridor to a room with gray cinder block walls, a blue concrete floor, and a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling. The coffin, still on the gurney, sat in the middle of the room. Callahan was using a hammer and a crowbar to pull nails out of the lid. He looked up when they walked in. Nice t-shirt. I figure Cravens wouldn't mind, Green said. I don't know about that, Callahan said. 
Hart snorted. Ron wouldn't mind, Leonard. And you know it. You about done there? Callahan stood back from the coffin. Think so? Then here. Get on a pair of these. Hart was holding a box of disposable rubber gloves. He may have left prints on inside of the coffin. They each ended up taking a pair. Crawford pulled his tight, snapping the ends as he did so. All right, Hart said. Let's see what we've got. Callahan pulled out the last nail. The lid shifted. He put his arms around one end and tried to slide it off. Damn, that's heavy. Green grabbed the other end, Crawford grabbed the middle. On my count, bring it towards me. Then we'll slide it on the floor, okay? Callahan asked. One, two. You all be ready, Crawford interrupted. All right, be ready for what might be in there. Callahan and Hart looked nervous. Green looked Crawford in the eye and nodded. They lifted the lid off, bent down, and set it on the floor. Behind them, Hart swore. Crawford stood and turned around. The inside of the coffin was immaculate. Shiny white cushions stretched the length of the box. Lying on them was the body of a young woman. She was naked, her arms folded across her chest. A red cloth bag was tied over her head. Her right hand had been cut off. Jesus Christ. Callahan stared down at the body and ran his hand back through his hair. He turned away, then back again. Jesus H. Christ. In Jordan's Creek, it had been the left hand. In Lairdsville, both legs below the knee. There had been four other incidents of mutilation across the state, six altogether. But the other acts had all been committed on dead bodies. This corpse was fresh. Hart coughed and turned away from the coffin. She isn't from 1927, Green said. No. Crawford walked slowly around the coffin. She hasn't been dead more than a few days. It was what they'd feared all along. Fellows had started killing again.